and this note was written by Rabbi Nachman to his, this student, Rabbi Yisrael Dovodeser, who ended up passing away on this date. But there's a lot of significance behind it. If you want, towards the end, we can discuss how he got that note, and we're going to talk about his journey, how he became Breslev, really, and all the things he went through, and how it's alluded to in the parasha with Abba Mavinu and all these things. That they tie really nicely together, and we're going to discuss a little bit of the story of the lost princess, Rabbi Nachman's famous tale. As you know, he published 13 uh, epic tales, and these tales are the highest teachings he ever wrote. And interestingly enough, they're not really teachings in a sense of where it's based on lots of logic and written down uh, verses and stuff like that and trying to derive a concept from it. It's actually a parable. And these are actually his deepest teachings because what we say is the greater the tzaddik, the greater the righteous person is whenever he's able to bring a concept that's so high down to the lowest level. And that's what determines a big tzaddik. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai one of the levels of Moshe Rabbein Uso was able to bring down the Zohar and he writes in his book that his book is going to be the book of the redemption. So in Masachet Shabbat, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, it says that when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came to Kerem Beyavne, where all the big sages at the time were gathered, they all argued that Bnei Israel would forget the Torah. In the future generations, we would forget the Torah and we'd go off the path. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said no. You know why? Because in the merit of my book, the Zohar, which is the, basically the basis of Kabbalah, which is the deepest secret of the Torah, he's the first book, and he's the one to publish the first book, basically, about this. He said, because of the merit of my book, we're going to be redeemed. And writes out in Masechah Shabbat, because he said, he brings the pasuk, the verse from the Torah, that it should not be forgotten from the mouth of his children. And if you take the last letters of that phrase, ki, it's kaf yud, the, the, the yud, lo aleph, tishacha chet mi pi yud zao vav. You, you spell yochai. You repeat that one more time. Yeah. So it says ki lo tishacha mi pi zao. So ki is the last letter is yud. Safetevot. Safetevot. The last letters. Yeah. Gotcha. If you get the last letters, it spells that yochai. And what's the point? That it should not be forgotten from the mouth of whose children? Yochai's children. In the merit of who? The son of Yochai, which is Rabbi Shimon, who brought down this book, which he said was going to be the book of the redemption. So he said in the merit of this book. Now Rabbi Nachman came later and brought down concepts in the Zohar and made it even more applicable than Rabbi Shimon or Rabbi could. He revealed more secrets than Rabbi Shimon could. Proof of it is Rabbi Natan, the student Rabbi Nachman, said whenever he saw Rabbi Nachman and all the students gathered together, he was saying that... Um, had Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai only revealed the Zohar to Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba was the, the one who wrote it and transcribed it, then he, Rabbi Nathan said, we have received far more than Rabbi Abba did. Meaning, what Rabbi Nachman gave us, his legacy is far greater than Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's. And Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai have a perfect relation in their souls, being that they both come from the same root, Moshe Rabbeinu soul. And they're both, very, uh, they're both very connected. There's a beautiful story about how Rabbi Nachman came and met the soul of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who passed away thousands of years earlier. But he went to Israel for a few months and he went into the cave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Kever, where he's buried. And there he resurrected Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and he had a conversation. It's a beautiful story. You only could do that one time. And it's magnificent the way he explains it. About how they would bring the redemption together, how they would work together. And, all this, and there, it's actually in that cave that Rabbi Nachman actually got the secret for Uman Rosh Hashanah, which is the final tikkun, the final rectification for our, our souls. Because basically, on Rosh Hashanah, what happened? Adam ate from the tree and blemished all the souls. What happened? He had all the souls included within his body. And whenever he ate from the tree, he blemished all the souls and all the souls got dispersed throughout creation. And that's why we have sparks that are in different places that we need to go retrieve. So like Chabad's thing is retrieve the sparks because there's souls that are lost in different places. Now, what's Rabbi Nachman here to do? On the same day that Adam committed the sin, which is Rosh Hashanah, because he committed the sin on the same day he was born. And he was born on the day of the new year. So interestingly enough, Rabbi Nachman says, come to me on the new year, Uman, on Rosh Hashanah, and we're going to combine all the lost souls into me. Because he's going to rectify that concept of Adam. And once enough souls come there, then we're able to complete that rectification and the Mashiach will come. What about our sins though? So, Rabbi Nachman says one thing. He says, 
Well, that's an idiot Come of book two. Hmm? Lesson 88 of book two and 188 of book one. It goes through coming to the tzaddik on Rosh Hashanah and holds all the losses. So it says also in lesson eight of book two, the last lesson he ever gave, he discusses the importance of coming to him because each Jew has keys and tefillot that don't ascend properly because the Yetzirah swallows them. But to the tzaddik that's at such a high level, a righteous person that stands in the throat of the evil force and makes him vomit all the tefillot he swallowed up from us. Because basically all our tefillot, all our prayers never ascend because they're not in the proper mindset. The tzaddik has to literally sacrifice his life, stand in the throat of the satan, what we call the accuser, the main accuser, and he makes him vomit up all the, the lost prayers that we do. And then once he does that, he takes them all back and we have to go find the tzaddik and retrieve our losses. Now this concept is very deep because Rabbi Nachman says, come to me, ask me for your losses with a true and sincere heart, and I'll give them back to you. But only if you're worthy, only if you really ask from the bottom of your heart. If you really mean to change yourself, then I'll give them to you and to your entire entourage, your family, everyone. But you have to make that first step and go to the tzaddik. On Rosh Hashanah, specifically, we're doing a big tikkun, the, soul, the, the tikkun, the rectification of the sin of Adam, the first sin. And through that, we're able to bring the, the final redemption. But that's a different concept we're gonna, not going to go in entirely. We were back at... And this is meant, obviously, to be a little bit more... It's more chill, obviously. So if you guys want to cut off and ask something, you know, that's the point. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Nachman, how they're alluded together. It says Nachman ben Simcha, which is his name. Nachman, the son of Simcha, has the same numerical value as Shimon ben Yochai. And those two are perfectly alluded to in the sense that Rabbi Nachman once said, when he was in Uman, a few years before he passed away, he told all his students... You guys think you guys have to go all the way to Meron to find Rabbi Shimon. But you guys don't realize there's a Rabbi Shimon in Uman. And at that point, people started realizing that him and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which are the two highest unique souls that will come down into the world to achieve a rectification for all the lost souls of the Nezhe, the Jewish nation. These two are perfectly alluded to in their, basically in their mission to bring back all the lost souls. There are two shepherds in which they really bring back. And Rabbi, Shum, and Rabbi Nachman did what Rabbi Shimon Barachai couldn't do, and that to bring the Zohar into a place where even the lowest person can, bring it, uh, can understand it. So if you look at his book, he'll explain deep concepts that Rabbi Shimon Barachai could not really bring down. And how do you explain that? Like um, almost like make bring it understandable. Make it practical. So Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman came. And that was finishing Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's job, do, uh, job, and his mission is entirely something different. That's a little bit about Rabbi Nachman, and we're going to explain a little bit about the story of the lost princess. But first, we're going to go into Rabbi Nachman's student, Rabbi Nathan. And it's very important to study Rabbi Nathan's works because Rabbi Nachman said, Without my student, you guys cannot understand anything. Because he said, you cannot learn from me. My light is too great. It would basically blind you in the sense that you cannot grasp anything from me. My mission is far greater than you guys can ever understand. The only way you guys can take from me and take in the things that I have is through my student. So Rabbi Nathan is the main successor of Rabbi Nachman. And after that, there was no rabbi. It says Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nathan. We always allude to those two because those two are the biggest combo that would be able to rectify the first sin and bring back all the souls. And they have the same concept you have to explain in Moshe Rabbeinu and, and Yehoshua. And Yehoshua. So in lesson, si yeah. mm -hmm. in lesson six of Rabbi Nachman's Likutei Moran, his masterpiece, he discusses the relationship between the Talmud, the student, and the Rav, the master. And how... Eat the, for them to come back, for, for a tzaddik to be a real tzaddik at the level of the highest, the highest level, you need to have the student that's able to diffuse the teachings because the light is too big. So if Rabbi Nachman didn't have Rabbi Nathan, he wouldn't be Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman said, without Rabbi Nathan, you guys have nothing. And without me, obviously, Rabbi Nathan has nothing. So it's a relationship that with those two, they're able to bring something down that no one's ever seen. But the most important thing is, where we get to, and it's a good introduction to understand before we get into the teachings of the tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman, it's to make yourself nothing before the tzaddik. Why? Because if you make yourself nothing, you're able to take in. This is a concept about honor and humility in the sense that if we leave room for doubt and for this and for that, meaning there's many other tzaddikim, there's other people, why, are we, why do we need to bind ourselves to a tzaddik like Rabbi Nachman? Can I connect God on my own? When you do that, 
you don't need room to take in the teaching of the tzaddik. So Rabbi Nachman said, the one rule in which you need to come to the tzaddik is to make yourself nothing. Just like God. The tzaddik is a perfect manifestation of God in this world. He sends God, he, re, he makes God's message practical for each generation. And what we're, in, what we're supposed to do is bind ourselves to the tzaddik, take in his teachings with simple faith. And through that, we're able to attach ourselves to the highest level. Because Rabbi Nachman said, attach yourself to me, you literally become like him. It's basically a, a small person on the shoulder of a giant. That's what he alludes to. His students will become small people on the shoulders of the giants. He even said, my students will be led on a path that no other tzaddikim have ever been led on. Not even the tzaddikim, the righteous people in the past history have been led on. Because his path is so high and so exalted. If we make ourselves nothing before it and we decide to follow it simply, then we basically become like the tzaddik himself in a sense. He cannot do his mission without us and we cannot do his mission without him. So we diffuse, we're able to spread the teachings and he's the one obviously coming up with them and bringing them down. So it's a relationship that needs to, that, uh, that through this relationship, it's able to do a lot of rectifications and bring back a lot of souls. But you have to have that humility in the first place. So enough with the introductions maybe. And we're gonna go into the, we're gonna go into the Pasha. Now this week's Pasha is called Vayera. Vayera means, and he appeared to him. And the first verse of this Pasha says, Vayera el Hashem be'elonim amre. It says, God appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. Rashi, the main commentary of the Torah, says that it was Abraham's third day of his Brit Milah, circumcision. And it was obviously the hardest day, it's the, the day with the most pain. So he was sitting in front of the tent, actually waiting for visitors, because Abraham's most special mitzvah, his most special um, act, the one that he loved the most, was called Gemilut Chasadim. It was like almost entering the guests, meaning having people over and bringing them closer to God and all these things. That's how actually he did his hafatza, his diffusion of God and spreading God's message. He brought people into the tent. His tent was open on four sides and anyone walking in any direction would be able to come in, eat, sleep, and do whatever. That was his way. So it says, Abraham Avinu on his third day of his Milah, which is the most painful day, and he was 99 years old at the time. God came to him, appeared to him, started speaking to him. Abraham said, God, wait up. I know I want to see, I want visitors, and I know why you put out the heat in the day. What happened? It says, the Gemara says on that day, God took out the sheath from uh, surrounding the sun took out the layer of the sun and it made it so hot it was as if it was the heat of hell, basically. Interestingly enough, from that, the Arizal goes into a beautiful discussion saying that, what do we learn from that? That Abraham was standing in front, of, in front of the tent in the heat of the day, it says, specifically in the verse, Kechomayom. It says that the heat was like the heat of Gaina, the heat of hell. What do we learn from that? The Arizal says, Abraham sits at the gates of hell, the opening in hell, and anyone who keeps the Brit Milah, the circumcision, with purity, who has brit milah, who has circumcision, and who keeps it with purity, is not allowed to enter. He actually sends him immediately to Gan Eden, to heaven. Because of what? Because of this concept here. This is what we learn it from. Uh, and that's to show you the importance of basically the brit, because it's the final test of why we are here. The brit milah, the circumcision, sexual temptation, this is the final test of why we are here in this world. And that's why you technically seem to know, that's why we, see, uh, we notice that Rabbi Nachman's main focus was on this also. And that's why he came out with Tikkun Atali, the 10 Tehidim, to rectify lost seed. Because that's obviously the test of the generation. I always have this question. Whenever you say, like, it rectifies, like, the lost seed, right? Like, mm -hmm. we read Tikkun Atali, we go to the Mikveh, you know, all that. I guess we're, quote, unquote, like, clean, right? Yeah. So, so like, whenever we die, like, and, like, we go up, and so you're saying Abraham Avinu is standing at the gates... And whoever never Send had with problems, the he he sent them straight to Gan Eden. Mm -hmm. But the people that did fall, okay, they still okay. They did Tikkun they did Mikveh, they did Teshuvah, and but then all, we, it's the hardest thing, right? We do it, exactly. and then we go good, and then and then we, and then we fall again, right? So the Teshuvah. So so, so okay, I understand, but, but right, you 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 keep doing Teshuvah, and then okay, at one point, if normally you uh, for us like we fall again. Okay, so the way I see it is, do tshuva for it, obviously. You could go sin 
and literally a day before you pass away without you knowing. You're obviously in t- doing it from the heart. If you do true love from the heart and you tell God, I want to change my ways, and you rectify yourself and you don't do it anymore and you don't whatever it is, waste seed and all these things and blemish the breed, what happens is you do a complete tshuva and at that point, you basically rectify the sin. Now there's two levels of tshuva. There's a high level tshuva, tshuva ila'a and tshuva tata. There's a high level tshuva from the level of keter, which is not, I'm going to explain that now, I'll explain that in a second, and there's a tshuva tata. There's a lower level tshuva. The Zohar, written by Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai, the greatest tzaddik, says there's no tshuva for, the breed, for blemishing the breed. Which is quite a crazy concept because nowadays that loses a lot of our hope in the sense that we're, we're all blemishing this breed. And Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, no, you cannot, you cannot fix it. Interestingly enough, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did not have the capability to bring down a tikkun for this. A high level tshuva. Because what do we say? When one blemishes the breed, he disconnects the nine sfirot, the nine attributes of God from him, connecting him. The malchut, netzah, chod, yesod, uh, all these nine attributes of God, you disconnect from yourself, you lose your connection, which is basically your umbilical cord to God. There's only one sfirah that remains, it's the sfirah of keter. Why? Because the only way to do tshuva through the breed is through the sfirah of keter, the highest sfirah. So what does that mean? Only through tshuva ilaha can you do Rectify the breed, the blemishing of the breed, Mila and all these things. Rabbi Nachman says, part of that rectification is po- He said the rectification is possible. Where he disagreed with the Zohar and he says, only I understood this piece in the Zohar, but I tell you, there is hope. You can rectify this, and you don't necessarily need to go to Gainam for this sin, in essence. And you can rectify this sin, and you can do a Tshuva which Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai does not really mention. Tshuva ila'a includes, a high level tshuva includes doing hit bodedut, speaking with God every day, tikkun akladi, mikveh, and a tshuva from the heart, obviously. It has to be from the heart with a lot of crying and a lot of sincerity to want to get over it. Because the truth is, the result is not as important, it's more how you want to get there. Rabbi Nachman places, and we're going to talk about this today, Rabbi Nachman places an emphasis on the journey, not the result. So if you really want to get over the sin and you do not have the capability yet and you tell God every day, up there, they cannot judge you for it. Which is interesting. They cannot judge you for what happened, even if you commit the sin, because you didn't want to be there. And you tell God and you explicitly say to God, I don't want to be there. Rabbi Nachman says, up there, you're not going to get judged for it. Rabbi Nachman says, the only way you get judged up there, when after 120 years when you go up, is your soul goes in front of the bedi in the court, and what happened? God tells you, not did you commit this and this and this and this and He says, did you pray not to commit this sin? Did you pray to keep Shabbat? Did you pray to do mitzvot and feeding? All these things. It's all about the prayer and it's all about the effort, the journey to get there. And Rabbi Nachman says, that's the essence. That's what we're talking about here. So, to do a tshuva ila'a, has to come from the heart. Rabbi Nachman talks about the concept of circumcising your heart. Because the truth is, it's a very scary concept, but all the lost seed that we have, basically, goes down into the lower depths of the world, and they're actually their own bodies and their own souls. You create a body and a soul. Each time a seed is wasted, and what happens? They call out and they cry. The only way to call out that rectification and to, cry, and to bring out that rectification and not make sure that they get transferred, not from the, they get transferred from the evil side to the pure side, is if you do a tshuva from the heart. To do he bodedut, to circumcise your heart. And the way to circumcise your heart is through speech and tefillah, through prayer. So, tikkun akali is obviously 10 tehidim, 10 praises, which is prayer. Hid bodedut, mikveh, and a lot of, from, from the heart, a lot of tefillah from the heart, from the, uh, from the essence, from your neshama. And what you do in essence, is if you do tshuva, tata, a lower level tshuva, you're not able to bring back your sins and make them into merits. Interestingly enough, though, if you do a tshuva ila, a high level tshuva, all the sins you did actually get turned into mitzvot. So interestingly enough, all the bl- black angels that are created up there, if you do a tshuva ila, which is basically Rabbi Nachman's entire Torah, if you do that, up there, all the black angels get turned into white angels. So in fact, you will not see any black up there, which is quite crazy. Only if you do tshuva tata, what happens, the white will defeat the black. There's no changing the black into white. It's just that they basically get vanished. It's not, in essence, 
piling it on top to the mitzvot. But when a person does tshuva from love, from ahava, which is the essence of Rabbi Nachman's Torah, to find God and to search out for him through love, what happens is all the sins that we do get turned into merits and mitzvot. Even if we went to the worst places, the worst sins, especially with the breed, because it's considered one of the worst things, what happens, all of that potential that you lost, in fact, gets turned into mitzvot. And you create spiritual children and all of these things. There's lots of deep secrets with this because the brit is the final test. We know Adam Arishon, the first man, sinned with the brit. The final test is also with the brit. And came Rabbi Nachman and revealed a big tikkun, tikkun atadi. Now, interestingly enough, in the introduction, he writes that tikkun atadi is specifically for a wet dream at night, where it's unintentional and all these things. But... There are big Rabbanim in Breslev that Rabbi Nachman didn't reveal the full power of Tikkun Atali because if he did, there would be basically no free will. So what did he say? He alludes to this concept, and this is going to a completely different section, but might as well go into it anyways, because it's important. Rabbi Nachman talks about an armor that can revive the dead. Now, he talks about the beautiful story, which actually got lost over time. He told a beautiful story to all the students when Rabbi Aharon, his main, one of his main students, Rabbi Natan, his main student, and all the people around him, he told a story about an armor. There's actually a beautiful story about the woman, the, the what do you call it, mom? It, where it's the story? The water castle. Where the prince, is it the princess that flees and tries to go through the 10 types of uh, tests and all these things and gets to the end with the 10 arrows and all these things. There's a lot of deep secrets with that story about a water castle, a princess fleeing, trying to go through 10 gates and people are chasing after her and they're shooting arrows at her. But what happens? I forgot the end of the story, but basically the story of the armor, which got lost over time, has to do with that. And the mysticism behind the story of armor is basically saying, Rabbi Nachman saying, the Brit, whenever you waste it and all these things, it basically kills you because it's such a bad sin in essence. It basically destroys your connection with God and all these things. But there's an armor that's so powerful that's able to block any arrow that comes and hits you. So if you think about any armor, there's armor that's very, with strong metal, but it doesn't protect the eyes, for example. It doesn't protect the feet because you need to move. So imagine that armor. He says this armor, this thing that can be able to rectify all the ways they see and all these things is actually much stronger than this type of armor. He then thinks of an armor that has a stronger metal and protects more of the body. He says, not even this armor, it's even stronger than this armor. And he goes to the point where it's saying, even if the arrow pierces your armor, my armor is so strong that it's able to revive a dead person. You know what he's referring to? Tikkun HaKlali, the Tentei. A person reads Tikkun HaKlali, Rabbi Nachman says, by his kever, one time in his life, go to Uman, read Tikkun HaKlali, have the will to change, as is mentioned in Chayim Oran, his life story. You, have the, you go there with the will to change. Give a little bit to tzedakah, charity. Do the tikkun akali. Rabbi Nachman assures you by his, he says, this I'm more certain than any of the things I say. I will pull you out of hell by your peyot, by your side, by your side lock, basically. And interestingly enough, what people don't recognize in this phrase is he says, she'ol tachtiot. The student of the Arizal came and revealed a secret that there's seven gates in Gehinam, in hell. Six gates you can get out. One gate, you do not exit. There's one gate, you go down to hell. People think you go to hell and you go back up. The student of the Ariza, who's one of the biggest Kabbalists, also from the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu, one of the highest souls, his student says, there's a lower level called Sheol Tachtiot, and through certain sins, you end up there and you do not exit. What's one of the sins? Wasting seed. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough. Rabbi Nachman came. Oh, Rabbi. <laughs> so, no worry, there's, a, there's a waiting list. To go. So, so, uh, so, so, so Rabbi Nachman came and did a tikkun that no one's able to do. Even Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's old soul was not even able to do. And even the Arizal, who said you have to do 84 fasts for one time before you see it, Rabbi Nachman said to him, Ten te'ili. Just read Ten te'ili. Come once, my kever, and I'll pull you out of the place where you do not exit. One time. That's all you need to do. One time with the will to change and all these things. What so, did he say that the relationship between the, uh, you see, the, the way he says about the... So, She'ol Tachtiot, he cer is? uses a certain name, a type of gay, no? Ah. She'ol Tachtiot being the... Who's the, who's the rabbi? Who? Who's the... the, the student of Um He wrote Reshit Chochma, the book called Reshit Chochma. I'm not sure the author, but one of the students of the Arizal, obviously. 
Look up the book Rashid Chochma. He has a Shar Geinam, Shar Ayira, Shar Ava, a gate of love, a gate of fear, and in there he talks about every sin that gets you to which place in Geinam. Now, interestingly enough, came Rabbi Nachman and basically slapped down all those big judgments and said, "Now we're sweet." Comes me the tzaddik, and if you bind yourself to me, those things really, just do your work. He says, bring me the cement, bring me the brick, and I'll make wonderful buildings. Look what he says. He brings the pasuk in, uh, in Halev. He says, Eben ma'asu abonim haita The stones that were disgusted by the previous builders, the bonim, the constructors, haita le'roshpina will then become eventually the pinnacle of the, the, the structure. What happens? He explains this by saying, there were past tzaddikim, past tzaddikim, past righteous people that couldn't do anything with the dirty souls that we are, the final souls that are coming down and are in the final generation. Those tzaddikim did not want them at all. In fact, they were like stones by the builder. They threw them out and chucked them across the street, waiting for each tzaddik coming and literally all he'd have left were the disgusting stones. Why did God bring Rabbi Ahmad to the final, the final place? Because there's a soul that's so high that he's able to rectify all the stones, which are the souls, basically. It's an allusion to the soul that no other tzaddik wanted to because they couldn't have the capability. Rabbi Nachman came and said, Eden ma'asu abonim, the stones that were disgusted by everyone else, Haytar Rosh Bina, with me, will become the pinnacle. Not only will they become a part of the decoration, meaning they'll, part, they'll have a place in Olam Abba and the world to come, they're actually going to become the most beautiful place, the most beautiful pieces. The most disgusting stones will become the biggest people. Just by doing what? Making yourself humble before the tzaddik and taking in his teachings. Without any arrogance, just the will to do it. Rabbi Nachman said, open up my book, Likutu Moran, and any person with at least a little openness and a little desire to come close to, and just to read the teachings, but just the desire to get close to God, he said, there's no way that his heart will not turn to him. There's no way. He says it like this. He said, all the, all the stubbornness and stuff like that will move completely. Just come open up the book with a simplicity, and with a will to get close to God, and that's it. Because Rabbi Nachman obviously included all the nishamot that would ever open up that book within the teachings. In each lesson, he has allusions to each soul that will ever up, open up to the book and all his future students and all these things. But this is a discussion for something else. But with regard to the Brit and stuff like that, just know, Rabbi Nachman said, when no other tzaddik said this, all the other tzaddikim said there's no hope for this, Rabbi Nachman said there's hope. What is it? When you come to the tzaddik, you're able to rectify everything else. It's the basically, it's, it's a shortcut. There's no other way of going around it. It's a shortcut. All you need to do is do your part, Rabbi Nachman says. Bind yourself to me, do everything you want, meaning do everything you can to get close to God. Give your life over it. Just get up close to God and do your will. But do not detach yourself from me because once you do that, it's a totally different story. The place you end up, no, no, no. The tzaddik is here in the final place because God know, has so much mercy. He needs a final person to really put all the pieces together. And he loves us so much that he brought us a tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman, to, to do all this. And it's a pity that so many people, we have this gift, this jewel. He's the final treasure before the redemption. In fact, he said he was the Mashiach of the generation. We just weren't worthy. In fact, he said the Mashiach is going to be one of his students. Coming to show that he, even the Mashiach needs Rabbi Nachman. The Mashiach cannot do his rectification of his own soul without Rabbi Nachman. The Mashiach is going to go to Uman, do all the things that he needs to, only because Rabbi Nachman giving him all the tools necessary to be able to reveal himself. So, came Rabbi Nachman and revealed a lot of things, but most importantly, his messages of hope. Whereas no other tzaddikim really gave the hope to the final generation, Rabbi Nachman came. The soul of Rabbi Shimon Baruch Hai came again, reincarnated and all these things. The highest part, the highest soul to come down, and said, there's hope, just bind yourself to me. Do the best you can. Tikkun Akradi, all the things that he did, all the things that he said. He built a dude speaking with God. He says an hour ideally every day. Obviously, you build up to that. You don't get started with an hour. You start two minutes, three minutes, and over time you get there. But through these things, you're able to rectify all the sins we did. Not only for yourself, but he says for your ancestors, for your family, for your friends, for everyone else. And then you know what it is? You're binding yourself to tzaddik. Rabbi Nachman said, give me your heart and I will return you a heart that's completely clean. Naki. Totally clean. When you go to Rabbi Nachman, you give him your heart. You go to Uma and all these things that he says. We all combine. We have one heart. Rectifying the sin of Adam who made separate souls. We put all the souls back together. We create one body and we serve God. 
like one man with one soul. You know why the sea didn't split initially when Bnei Israel were traveling out of Egypt? It says because Yosef, Yosef, uh, it says because Moshe Rabbeinu saw, no, my bad, I'm going to go retract. God came to the angel of the sea and said, remember that deal we made at the beginning of creation before I created you? I told you that you're going to have to open the sea in a few thousand years for my children. And he showed him the picture of what they'd look like. Now the, the angel of the sea comes back to God 2,000 years after God tells him, open up the sea. He says, but the picture you showed me looks different than what they look like right now. You showed me one neshama. You showed me one soul. Here I see thousands of souls. So you know, Rabbi, you know Moshe Rabbeinu did the entire night? He made all the souls united. He brought them to unity in one night. That was the work that Moshe Rabbeinu did the entire night before the sea split. To bring them back to one. And that's the redemption. When we bring all the souls back together into one, into the soul of Moshe, which is what Moshe did at the time of Yamsuf and Nabi Nachman, the same soul of Moshe, the, the, the highest aspect of the level of Moshe, coming back and asking all the souls to come back to him. And that's what we're doing, the rectification for all the past sins, and which will, God willing, lead us into the redemption, especially through the Petek, because the Petek revealed something wondrous, which is the song of the redemption. It says in the Zohar, the Zohar says that there's a song that's single, double, triple, quadrupled. That this song is going to be sung all over the world at the time of the redemption. And this is going to be the song of refuah, of healing and redemption and all these things. What's that song? It's Na Nach Nachma Nachma Meoman. As is brought in the Petek. And there, Rabbi Nachman revealed a big secret to Rabbi Yisrael Dovah The one who got the Petek and told him that this is going to be the final thing. The final key is na nach nach ma nach ma no man. What's the secret behind that? The fact that the end na nach nach So I thought that if everybody says it at the same time, Moshiach comes or something, so they're like stuttering through it so people will catch up or whatever. So there's a lot of big tikkunim with it because we say that so the name of the tzaddikim can bring a lot of redemption. So with the idea that it's a first letter, first, second, yeah. first, so second, third, what's the... That's a Zohar that says it's a song that's single, drop, double, triple, quadruple. That's going to be the song of redemption. It's a single, meaning it's one letter. The second letter, the first letter plus the second, the first, second, third, and so on and so forth. That's the song of the redemption, the Zohar says. Came thousands of years later, and inside the Petek has that same structure that the Zohar is talking about. And why is it beautiful? What's really the beauty of it? What's the song? It's the name of Rabbi Nachman. Because he's the one coordinating the entire redemption. When the Bala Tanya was asked, the one who wrote... The Tanya, obviously, the first Chabad Rebbe. When he was asked, what are we going to do with Rabbi Nachman? Because they all wanted to put Rabbi Nachman in Kherem, excommunication. You know what the Bala Tanya said? You're going to put him in excommunication? Him and his students are going to be the ones to bring the redemption. So, even the Bala Tanya, Bar Shem Tov, the beautiful story of the Bar Shem Tov, when he was on the way to Israel, the his Satan... Right? What? His grandfather? It, his great-grandfather, his exactly. Grandfather. The Bar Shem Tov, which was... Basically, one of the biggest tzaddikim, also. One of the five neshamot alluded to in the souls of Moshe. Who's the great-grandfather of who? Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman. Oh, no one. So, the Baal Shem Tov was actually yeah. on the way to Israel because he said if he had reached yeah. Israel and met with one of the big yeah. rabbis there, they would have brought the Mashiach. The soul of the Mashiach. Yeah. He never got there. But what happened? The Satan, the evil accuser, came to Rabbi, uh, the Baal Shem Tov on the boat. And the Baal Shem Tov ended up talking to the Satan. And the Satan told him, Throw your daughter overboard, or else I take all your teachings. When the daughter heard this, she said, "Okay, I'm jumping off because your teachings are so important. They're gonna be the so, they're gonna be the secret to the redemption. I will give up my my life just for the teaching, just to keep your teachings." This daughter jumped in, and inside the water, she said, "No, no, no, wait, pull me out." The Bashem was true. Was very, because obviously from his part, he never wanted to give up his daughter. Obviously. For him, it was a, made the choice, though. exactly, but it was a sacrifice that he and her, she knew that they would both bring the redemption just through this. She asked to be pulled out when she was inside the water, and Baal Shem Tov pulled her out. He said, "Why?" He, she said, "I'm gonna have a grandson that's gonna be even bigger than you, and reveal teachings that are gonna bring the redemption. So you need me. Throw away all your teachings. He threw them all out. All the things that we have from the Baal Shem Tov are not teachings at all. They're in fact only stories." And that's why, because the daughter of the Baal Shem Tov, Adel, Odel, sacrificed herself, but then realized she had a prophetic vision inside the water. And she said that she would have a granddaughter, a grandson, that was even greater than her father, wow. that would bring the teachings down. I didn't hear that one. I didn't hear that one until a month ago. I didn't hear that that's one until a month ago. It's a beautiful one. It's an underground one. <laughs> <year. laughs>
So I hope the grants are done, you know. That's a little bit about <laughs> the soul of Rabbi Nachman. Just pass, huh? <laughs> Rabbi Nachman has, is a wondrous soul, a wondrous person. He said, I'm very wondrous. My soul is extremely wondrous. No one can understand the mission of Rabbi Nachman. And here we are trying to diffuse his teachings. And why do I speak so much about Rabbi Nachman on the day of Rabbi Yisrael de Tzilula? Because Rabbi Yisrael was in fact no one except for Rabbi Nachman. He made himself nothing to the point where all his message was just to diffuse Rabbi Nachman. He himself made him, he was transparent. He had nothing of his own. His entire mission was just to simply reveal the teachings of Rabbi Nachman. And from such a level of simplicity and humility, he had no honor at all. And we're gonna start, we're gonna, I have so many, I have videos on YouTube and stuff like that about the mission of, of meaning about the videos of Rabbi Yisrael over the You see how simple he was, how he literally acted with zero honor in just spreading the mes- message of Rabbi Nachman. Because he knew the important. And that's why he merited to get the petek, because he made himself nothing. Say the beautiful story about him when he went to France and they wanted to honor him. And he said, I will have to fast. Oh, uh, with the thing. I mean, I have another also beautiful story with Kiddush, and they honored him at our wedding. But I'm, we're, we're going to explain this at the end. Let's do a little bit about Likut Elachot, Rabbi Nathan in the parasha. And this is a deep secret that no one really learns. The secret about how to find your soul, which is totally alluded to in the this, this story of the Lost Princess. And we're going to get into the story of the Lost Princess. I'll give a little introduction about the Lost Princess a little bit later. And the, sto- the Sipur e Masyot, the epic tales of Rabbi Nachman. Because these stories and epic tales of Rabbi Nachman are the highest teachings that I've ever brought down. I've ever written down. We're going to explain it a little bit. But I'm going to read a little bit of the Tikkut Arachot, Rabbi Nathan's commentary. And we're going to get into it. A very applicable concept today. So what do we say? We get back into the parasha. God appeared himself to Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and there Abraham was sitting at the gates of at the tent, at the opening of the tent, in the heat of the day. What does Rabbi Nathan say? When God appeared to Abraham, this is the aspect of God revealing himself to him, as is normal. And this is where the turnaround point is, where Rabbi Nathan is explaining a deep secret. This is only possible to reveal God. Because the biggest problem today of why people give up is because they don't see God. They think it's easy. You know, Rabbi Nachman, his entire mission was basically to combat atheism because he was very against philosophy and very against sophistication. As a kid, he, he said, throw away all the sophistication, serve God simply. He as a kid would, relax, would rely simply on emunah. It's, it was said that when he'd go do his ibadudut, his meditation when he was a kid, he'd literally go out on a, a tiny boat little kayak into the, the river and he did row. He sucked at rowing. He did not know how to do it at all. He risked his life, go on the thing and ask God to save him every day on purpose. Just because he had the simple faith that God would save him. Even if he sucked at rowing, he sucked at going on the boat. He did it on purpose just so that he could have the simple one of saying, just me and God, that's He's it. Whether I die or not. <laughs> he was five years old at the time. Six he was years old. all in all in because the truth is when you're not all in there's nothing <laughs> what if you don't if believe in God if you're not all in you're not in at all yeah, if you're not all in you're out <laughs> Rabbi Nachman said shame is the person who doesn't have any emunah you know why because emunah is just a belief if you don't believe that everything comes from God what are you doing with your life all you need to do is believe it problems. all you need to do is believe it it's simple so Rabbi Nachman said get rid of the sophistication especially he said the dangers of philosophy and other things but we're not going to get into that but just serve God simply Without any sophistication. And this is the highest level of all. The highest and the highest. You can achieve the most rectification with not even the biggest Kabbalists can tell you to do. Because Rabbi Nachman went above them all and said, you know what? Go back to the simple level. Because you know what? The meditations and the way the previous Kabbalists thought and they brought down, it's not applicable in the final generation because we are definitely not worthy of praying with meditations and all these things. He says, rely, simple on, rely on simple faith and there you'll see the biggest uh, revelations, the biggest redemptions for you. So what's Rabbi Nathan saying here? You cannot see God, literally. You cannot have an appear, a revelation of God if you don't go through the chamber of exchanges. And this, and he says to separate the Ketusha from there. What's the chamber of exchanges, Rabbi Nathan says? This is basically called the Klipat Noga. The Klipat Noga is called the... the it, there's seven levels of there's seven levels of uh, there's three levels four levels of non-holiness and three levels of kedusha. The one in between is called klipat noga. It's a neutral level, half evil, half good. 
what we're supposed to do is in fact bring out all the things that are inside this realm and render them holiness, render them holy. So kosher food, for example, is in fact existing within the realm of Klipat Noga. Whereas non-kosher food is so low, we cannot rectify it because there's not enough Ketushat to be able to reveal. So kosher food exists in this, within this fourth realm, the Arizal says, of Noga. And what we do whenever we make a bracha, we're able to elevate the spark within this realm and render the evil in this, in this realm totally holy. Because there's enough Ketusha within there to be able to elevate. But non-kosher food is so non-holy that you cannot elevate it. So in fact, you're doing a lot of more damage. So what is Noga? Half evil, half good. Rabbi Nathan says you cannot go and see God unless you go through this chamber of exchanges. What is the exchanges? All the doubts and confusions we have. And this is where it gets very interesting. This is why the Pasuk says, in the plains of Mamre. Why? Because Mamre comes from the word Tmura, which is exchanges. So what's it say? He's saying, you have to go through the chamber of exchanges, the doubts and confusions, whether to hold on to the tree of life or the tree of death. The tree of knowledge. Had Adam waited not to, and not ate from the tree, he would have eaten from the tree of life and entered Canaan and had the tree of life. The Torah is called Etzachayim, the tree of life. If we don't, we go to the other side, it's the tree of death. The tree of good and evil. Confusion. What the Etzachayim is supposed to do? His entire job is actually to get us confused to the point where we don't know whether we're doing something right or wrong. Whether we're on the right path or wrong path. So if you look at us today, all the time, we always dealt with confusions and doubts of whether we're on the right path or not. You could be doing a mitzvah, but you don't know whether you're doing it. And whether you're in the sin, you don't know whether you're doing a sin or not. And it's a crazy thing because this is the final test of the etzara. And he's hiding the appearance of God. What's up, bro? Joe, pull up a seat if you want. We have uh, pizza and stuff like that. If you want wine. <clears throat> so... You have to go through this chamber of exchanges in order to see God. And once the exchanges, all the doubts that we encounter and all that. Man, this is where it gets more beautiful. That there you have to, So what's the Lashon Tumura, the chamber of exchanges? There is a place where the Yetzara tries to mix up the good and the bad. And tries to help you forget which one is which. And there is where the Yetzara has a lot of grasp. And where it can really change a person and bring him to a big downfall. There, he's in this chamber, he's able actually, he has the power to bring a person from the tree of life, which is the Torah, to the tree of death. And what happens is, So, what does Rabbi Nathan say though? If you want to see God, you cannot see God without the test of confusion. In fact, the only way to see God is if you go down to the lowest place. And this goes into a lesson of Rabbi Nachman's Torah, Nikte Moran, lesson 12, uh, book, uh, lesson 12 of book 2, the Good Moran Tinyana, where this he talks about the concept of Ayyame Kom One of the deepest secrets where he says, the final, test of the, the final test to bring the Mashiach will be to bring God into the sin that you're doing. You know why? Because all the tzaddikim in our past history and all the big nishamot never went down to the lowest place, so they couldn't retrieve the Ketusha from the lowest place and all the clubs and all the this and all the that. Come the lowest nishamot, and God brings them the lowest nishamot on purpose in the final generation that will literally encounter all the hard tests of the breed, of this, of women, of whatever it is, of confusions, philosophy, and all these things. Because what's their goal? To grab onto the tzaddik, which is a rope up there. Literally, the tzaddik lowers them down into the minefield, goes down to the lowest place, and there, because the tzaddik is so high, he cannot taint himself with the lower places. He brings down that low place and makes him have a res gives him a use to bring down the Ketusha from that low place. Whereas the Tzaddik couldn't do that before. That's why God brings down all these lows in Shemot, to go down to the lowest places, to bind himself to the Tzaddik and give back all the Ketusha to God. Where the Tzaddikim cannot do this. So what does Rabbi Nachman say? He says falling is actually very good. Because in order to get up, you cannot get up without falling first. So he says, you want to see God? You cannot see God if you're in constant, uh, what do you call, autopilot. You're learning Torah all day. You're in the Bate Midrash and you have literally no test whatsoever. You're getting paid for this and, work, and uh, you know what I mean? That you, your Panasa, your livelihood is being paid for by someone else and all these things. You have to go down into the real world, retrieve the Ketusha, and there you'll be able to find the sparks that were never found before. And this is the concept of going down 
and to separate the Kedusha from this chamber where it's very murky, where you can't really recognize, where you can't separate the Kedusha without having to go down there. You have to go down there, retrieve the Kedusha, and bring it back up. And Rabbi Nachman said, when you fall, know one thing, very good, because you're on the way up. When a person is like this, this is a sign of death. As we know, look at a monitor whenever a person's in a hospital. If he goes like this, the guy's dead. If he goes like this, though, that's a sign of life. When you move up, when you move down. What's the proof of it? Avraham Avinu, age 75. He brings a lot of converts and he's chilling, basically, in the place that he's in, living in, Haran, in Iraq, basically. Mm -hmm. What did God tell him? I don't like this Avodat Hashem. I don't like this Avodat Hashem. As Joe said, Lech Lecha. I don't like this Avodat Hashem of serving God because it's cruise control. There's no test. You're not moving up and down. You're just converting people. But in essence, you're old. You settle, you settle down. All you have is the people that you've converted around you. But there's no movement. There's no falling. There's no moving up. So what did God tell him? Go. 75, you're going to go because you start new every day. Never ever think that if you're, not, that if, uh, that if you're being tested and all these things, that it's a bad thing. Because the truth is, the only way to find God is this is through the test itself. And this is a deep secret that I've been not focusing on the, the importance of the test. Because what it says in the Gemara, if you haven't been tested within, I think it's like seven days or something. It says 30 days. 30 days, 30 days. 30 days that's what it is. Also, if you haven't had a, if you haven't had a, uh, there's also the concept of not having a dream, but all these things, but the concept of getting tested, if you haven't been tested in 30 days, know that God has forgotten you. God has forgot you. He's forgotten you. Has it ever happened? I don't think it's ever happened, no. So, if you don't dream, meaning no, the people no. who are very far from God, no, if you don't, uh, if you don't get tested, tested, meaning if you're not, if you haven't been tested, you just yeah. on cruise control for thirty days, basically, know that God forgot you. Yeah, but that can happen so many times, especially with like people that learn all day in yeshiva all day. Right? Ah, so what's the point? The point is to go down to the place. And not the point is to go <clears throat> sin, God forbid. The point is not to be comfortable where you're at. It's to continue pushing yourself. So for the yeshiva. For the Bacha, Bacho and Yeshiva. He has a different test, which is different from all of us. His is basically more stable in the sense that he gets to learn all day. But he also has a lot of the piling of garbage, which he has which when he teaches people and all these things. Because the truth is, when you teach a lot of people and bring back Neshemot, the Kripa puts back all the sins of the person that you're bringing back on the shoulders of that person. So he has a lot of tests in which aren't comparable to us as well. But it's a responsibility also. But for those that are just learning all day and who don't really have a fluctuation up and down, no, that's not the, the real Abba Hashem. What's the Rabbi Nachman tell us? The point is, us, why do the people that have fallen to the lowest places are able to go to Rabbi Nachman? And this is where Saba, I, I heard a beautiful thing. A person came up to Saba and said, why do so many French people come near you? When, Saba, when Rabbi Yisrael when he's in, was in his old age, why are there so many French students? You know what he said? Hem t'mimim vehem me'od me'kulkanim. They're very simple, but what? They're very damaged. <laughs> because the only way to come to the tzaddik is if you've gone to the lowest place, to the damage. That's why all the lowest neshamot today, we're all gone to the lowest place. We're all through the sins of the breed. We're all, we're all French. <laughs> because the truth is, with all the sins that we've done, we have to come to the tzaddik because it's the only tikva, the only hope we have left. What we talked about the breed and Rabbi Nachman being the only one who says that the rectification for it. Can I ask you a question? Doesn't it say somewhere that how she said that the, the final redemption will happen with something in France. So maybe that's with the French. That maybe has a, I, a correlation. I think so. That. Look, go to Uman and you'll see how many French people are there. Because the truth is, the French have actually... Funny enough, I think what we were talking... Mom, you once told me that the French test, in essence, each country has its own oh, yeah. ta'aba, its own desire. Mm -hmm. And the French ta'aba is actually sexual temptation. So interestingly enough, the main test of Rabbi Nach, the main the concept, American, what about the American money, uh, mammon. There's no new beaches here in France. There are. <laughs> oh, you think also all the all the Jews in Morocco, Algeria, it's not, it's not Israel, as dominant as Miami, believing. Yeah. Is it black beach? Black beach. I I went there. It was so nice. <laughs> no, I didn't see it. I, I didn't see it. I was there two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't see it. Like it wasn't a nude beach. It was a How far is it? Where is it? Since like San Diego. Yeah. Nice. It's like off a cliff. It's, a, it's like oh. a hike and everything before. It's an unbelievable beach. Right? So, this is where we're at. Where the French people have their entire taba is the brit. So they need the biggest sadiq to come in, who's the master of the brit. In order to be called a sadiq, the Zohar says, if you want to be called sadiq, just plain sadiq, man de natar. 
One who conquers the Brit is a tzaddik. Anyone who is Shomer Habrit is called a tzaddik, according to the Zohar. One who does not waste seed, one who does not protect himself from women and all these things. Yosef at tzaddik. Yosef at tzaddik, because he withstood the test of the Brit. Yeah. Noah also is called Noah each tzaddik. Why? Because he was born circumcised also, and he never committed the sin with the Brit. In fact, that's why it's called Teva, because Teva also means dead. And in fact, he didn't even know basically how to procreate because his breed became flaccid. Can you imagine? The Arizal says that. What do you mean by the sin of the breed? He was born circumcised. He was born circumcised. He was born circumcised. Moshe Rabbein was also born circumcised. There's Sadiqim that are very great ladies that are actually born circumcised. Oh, yeah, because Moshe Rabbein never, never mentions his circumcision. <coughs> yeah, and he never, he wasn't, wow. Who else is born circumcised? There's, there's people born today that are born circumcised. Moshe Rabbein. You're born circumcised? Yeah. You're born circumcised? You wouldn't have to pay. I was sent from God. No, some people just get to draw blood, no? What? They just draw blood. Exactly, yeah. they just draw blood. Yeah. Because there's a mitzvah of Peria, yeah. and there's uh, all these things. The spreading, the pulling back, the sucking of the blood, all these things. Metzitza, whatever it is. But you tend to notice... To, be, to have the biggest tzaddik, you need the lowest people. Because why would God wait to bring the biggest person if not for the lowest neshamot? The lower the generation, the greater the redemption they need. And and that, exactly. The and how, do you yeah. te- how do you see the value of a master by looking at his student? It's true. Mm-hmm. You know, if the student is not, you know, is wonderful, you don't need to, to have the greatest teacher. So mm-hmm. what a waste of a tzaddik if you bring him to a generation that's already golden. Exactly. You know, thousand percent. Exactly. Thousand percent. That's the case. But what's interesting is though, Rabbi Nachman came, you know, a few hundred years ago, right? But, he's, but, his, but his Torah now, it's, it's only really in the last, what, 30 years, sure. 40 years where his Torah has like blown up. Mm-hmm. Uman, uh, 20 years ago in Uman, there was 10,000 people. Less. I don't, know, I don't know if it's the end or not end, but towards the end, we can get to, because uh, me, I don't even know so well, Saba's role in the whole... thousand percent. In We're going to get into the Saba thing. I'm about to speed it up. Hit, hit into, yeah, hit into the, into the <laughs> thing with Saba. Into the movement. Story Should I one. skip the lost princess? <laughs> no, 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 no. Do the, no, jump no, no. to the princess. Connect the polish to the princess. Uh, Should I finish this up and then yeah. go to it? Yeah. We'll do it quickly. But uh, yeah. No, I just need to. Uh... Mm-hmm. Thousand percent. Okay, so what does it say? In order to actually retrieve the Klusha from that place, you actually have to go to the lowest place, and there where the place is very. The, the place of doubt, the chamber of exchanges, where the Yitzhara exchanges the tree of death and the tree of life, that's where you'll find God. Hush, and what does it say? And because of the merit that you're able to separate the Tusha from the evil, and once you do that, then you'll merit the revelation of God. When Mamre came and gave advice to Abraham on the Brit Mila, David tomorrow is going to give a little class about that. I'm not going to get into it. But, um, there's a lot there. I'll, I'll skip that. And what does he say? He brings the midrash that says Ufaro hikriv and Paro approached Bnei Israel. What does that mean? Paro hikriv, she hikriv et Israel avayem shemayim. What is what's a, what's the chiddush here? It's in midrash Rabba that it was Paro specifically that brought Bnei Israel close to God, not anyone else, not Moshe. Paro, because of the test. Because of the place where it's very murky, that's where they get close to God. Not through the place where it's clear and stuff like that. What does Rabbi Nachman say? He brings the Pasuk in Lesson 6. If you ascend up to heaven, if you think you're in the place of heaven where God is close to you, Shamata, there God is. God is not near you, He's there. You have to travel a lot further, meaning God is not revealed. But if you make your place in the bed of Geinam, the lowest place, He's right there. Meaning what? In the lowest place, God reveals Himself. The biggest revelation of God. Rabbi Nachman says in the Moran, in the place which is dark, concealed, in, within the concealed places, certainly over there, you're going to find God there. You, it's, you find that in the story of Esther. In, uh, it's true. In Esther, Nistar, hidden. She but had it's hard to, to accept go in it. the worst exactly. place to find Hashem. Exactly. You just have to look. Look and accept. Exactly, look and accept. 
Mm-hmm. It's true. They can better use feeling that to accept the suffering with love. And that's, a, that's something that obviously takes a lot of effort. But this is a completely different perspective in the sense that when we fall, don't say there's no hope. Understand that it's actually through the fall that you actually move up. You should be very happy with the fall. Be happy and rejoice over the fact that you fell. And try to move yourself back up because you have to realize that through the lowest fall, you can go to a place which you never went before. But and even so like deeper this. than that, you wouldn't be happy if you're on the low. You'll only be happy if you overcame when uh, you're low and you're exactly. high to Chazak. look down. Chazak. Chazak. So. I like that a lot. What the, the Kutz, I think the Katsuka Rebbe says, what do you determine a tzaddik? By how many times he falls, but he gets up. A tzaddik falls seven times and gets back up seven times. That's what a tzaddik is. A tzaddik is just a willpower. It's the amount of time he moves up. Continue with it. What's he saying? The more the Yitzhara comes and pushes you down and pushes you further away from God, the greater the redemption in the sense that the greater the revelation, the greater you're going to see God. The further you are, the greater the, the place. So that's why a lot of Neshamot are born in places which are very dark. A lot of Jewish neshamot, because in fact, they are only their neshamot are able to retrieve the sparks that are so low. That's why you'll tend to notice the neshamot born in Yerushalayim in the most secular places. Their neshamot have a specific rectification, but there are neshamot born in Los Angeles, California, that have a specific tikkun, a specific rectification to do. And why? Because God knows that our neshama is very powerful, that he puts that certain neshama in the lowest place, because only that neshama is able to bring out the ktusha necessary. So in fact, it's actually a, it, God's doing us a favor and it's a, man, it's a beautifully manipulated thing and an orchestrated uh, uh, event with the Neshamot. And what did he say? And this is the, this is the turnaround point. This is the, the essence of what this lesson is. The, whenever you're pushed away, Tachlit is only for the goal of Hitkarvut, it's pushing you closer. When you're pushed away, it's in fact only to push you closer. And that's why Rabbi Nachman, much of the time, would actually push students away. In fact, only to grade in their will to come close. That's why Uman Rosh Hashanah and all these things happen, where we can't get there, because it's only to grade in the will to come after, to do it on our own will. And that's something that's very big. The fall is for the purpose of the ascent. In fact, without falling, you cannot ascend. Only through the place where it's dark and through the place where there's a lot of confusion, only there can you come and be able to find the Tusha. And that's why Abraham had to go through all these tests with the Brit Milah. In fact, it said he couldn't even cut the Brit Milah because his, brit, his flesh wasn't fresh, it was so old. He, it would take him like literally hours to cut the breed. He couldn't cut it. And that's the struggle that the tzaddik has to go through. He has to go through the place where it's very difficult. And what in his old age? Because what Hashem telling him? You start new every day. And this is about Saba. We're going to get to Saba in a minute. I'm going to explain a little bit about the lost princess and get into Saba about being new. And renewing yourself. Because the test is only there, in fact, to make you new. As Rabbi Nachman said one thing, which is Asur. He never really said Asur to do something prohibited to do. Forbidden to do something. He never said it was forbidden to do anything. He only says it with regard to one thing. Or one or two things, I think. Mm-hmm. And he says, It's forbidden to be old. What does that mean? To be old, uh, to be nine years old? No. He says to be old in thought. Always start anew every day. Because when you start anew every day, you allow yourself to find God every day. That's why it says the mitzvah bikurim, the first fruits given to the Kohanim, was actually why the world was created. It says in the Midrash, God created the world for the mitzvah Bekurim and Truma. And um, Maser, I think. Why? Those three mitzvot literally are, what is it? To give fruits to the Kohen. What, why would God create the world for that? You know what the mystical reason behind Bekurim is? Yeah, to grow the fruits. To grow the fruits. But which fruits do you give to the Kohen? The best one. No. That's the point. You give the first, the first ones. One. Uh, why? Because God wants you to give your fruits, your mitzvot, as if it was the first time you did it. It's not supposed to be the best. Make sure you do every mitzvah as if it's the first time. And when you do it like that, that's why the world was created. For a person who acts as if he did every mitzvah for the first time. God also says, with regard to this, about the confusions, it says in Bereshit, why did God create the world? For those who would have simple faith at the end of times and not fall into the philosophy and the sophistication and all these things. Those who serve God simply, even though they can't see Him. 
That's what Rabbi Nachman says, is how you see God. Now, we get into the story of the lost princess, and I'll, I'll go through it quickly because it directly alludes to this, and we'll get into Saba. Um, before we get into Sipur and Masyot, just to, under, just to help you guys understand what Sipur and Masyot is and the level it's at, the Baba Saleh, I sent the story, Joe knows it, the Baba Saleh, when he picked up Sipur and Masyot for the first time, when they gave him this book in Morocco, Rabbi Nachman's stories, he put on his Shabbat clothing and sat down at the table like this, like we're at right now. He put on white clothes and sat down at the Shabbat table. He opened up the first line of The Lost Princess, and what did it say? That first line. On the road, I told a story that anyone who heard the story had a thought of repentance. The Baba Saleh stood there and it was in his head. It was, his head was in the book for two hours. The people thought he fell asleep. So all the people around him left. When the wife came back and saw two hours later that he was still on the first page, but his head was moving. She gathered all the students back saying he was never sleeping. Come look. When they came to the Baba Sala and asked what happened, he said, just in the first line, it's taking me two hours because I haven't even really delved into the secrets of this first line. <laughs> he said, if, if it takes me this long, it's going to take me years to finish this book. I'm never going to finish it. Closed the book and he said, okay, it's already taken me two hours. Next time I'm going to open it up to God willing. But that was this, just to show you, this Baba Sala was taking two hours just on the first line. <laughs> the mysteries behind this level or not even. It said the Baba Sali also used to study Lik Temoran on Shabbat. That was his book of Shabbat. He used to keep it by his bedside table. And what was the quote I one line in English? Um, so the Rebbe spoke up and said, Well, on my journey, I told a story. Whoever, had this, whoever heard this story had a thought of Shuvah. We're going to explain just this first line right now. But you know, you have to explain that the Sipur Masyot comes to the, from the highest. So, yeah. No, you want to explain? No. <laughs> because my mom knows more what than a, my mom knows more than a, <laughs> more than me. What are the stories? I mean, it's something very special. So how did the stories come to play? Rabbi Nachman once came when all the students were gathered around, and he said, "I see my my Likute Moran lessons are not working. Now we're going to start telling stories. What's the mystery of that phrase? The mystery of that phrase is that there's a level through which a chuba can happen from a a waking up from below. What did that mean? When you do tshuva, you have to wake yourself up to bring down a, an abundance from God in order to help you get closer to Him. But that requires self-effort. That requires effort on your own to be able to create that abundance from above. Whereas if you don't put in that effort, if you don't cause a tshuva from below, there's no waking up from above. What does Rabbi Nachman say? I want you guys to become the biggest tzaddikim, he told the students. But this generation is so low that we're going to need to do something else. What are we going to do? We're going to start revealing stories. And this is also about an allusion to Megillat Estel because Megillat Estel, why does Megillat Estel get a place in Tanakh, in the 24 books? You know, Ezra Sofer, the one who compiled all those 24 books, did not want to include Megillat Estel in it, the redemption of Puri. He thought it was just a simple story. When Estel revealed to him the mysteries of the secret, why? Because she said this story is able to wake up a person from the, under, from the 50th gate of impurity. Which is a place where no one gets out. Know one thing, that when we were in Egypt, we were in the 49th gate. Had we went to the 50th, we would have never gotten out because there was no redemption from the place of the 50th place. Came Megillat Esther, Puri, and said, the 50th gate of redemption is this book of Megillat Esther. Why? Because the Megillah of Esther is able to wake up a person from the 50th gate of impurity. Rabbi Nachman came and said, my book, my Sipur and Masyot, is able to wake up a person that's even fallen lower than the 50th gate. To the place where it's even lower than the 70 gates, the 70 nations of evil and all these things. This book, what did he say? Why is it so big? Because there's no need for a tshuva from below. There's no need for an arousal from, uh, there's no need for an arousal from below. You don't need to put any effort. Read the story and Rabbi Nachman did the tshuva for you. The story itself implants within your neshama, the tshuva, without you even realizing it. And that's the beauty of that. There's no other book like that that's able to do a refua on your soul like, this, like these stories. That's why Rabbi Nachman says, read it in the vernacular that he wrote it in, which is really, really Yiddish, and there's deep secrets with the Yiddish. Prove now what? What? Now you can start. Now we can start. <laughs> because even that, we can explain how big these secrets are. Because the shach, I think the shach, no, I forgot. Anyway, the big tzaddik said, 
we know the Torah was created 2,000 years before the world was created. Right? How can the Torah be created, be created 2,000 years before the world was created if the Torah is perfectly applicable to this thing? So why did it say God was playing with the Torah and was enjoying the Torah 2,000 years? What's up, boys? Yo, if you guys want anything, grab it. What Torah was Hashem playing with 2,000 years before the world was created? You know what he says? It wasn't the Torah that we have now. It was the Torah of ancient stories. Why? Because those stories are the secrets to the creation of the world. And part of this is, these 13 stories are alluded to in the stories that God was playing with at the beginning of creation. The 2,000 years before. He says these stories come from Mishanim Kalmoniot, ancient years. Years before the world was created. This happens sometime, and there's lots of deep secrets of these stories. But the first story is about finding your soul. Which, and finding God, which is basically the concept we just talked about through the confusion you find God. What did he say? On the road, on a journey, I told the story. That anyone who heard the story had a thought of repentance. But before we get to that line, Rabbi Nachman starts the story with something else. It says in Hebrew, He answered and he spoke and he said. But it doesn't say what he was answering to. So... Where do we go? We go inside the story and there's a big question inside the story. One of the, per, one of the people inside the story asks, Where am I in the world? The big question of the entire story, where am I? And what does Rabbi Nachman say? The mystery of this answer, that anyone who hears this story has a thought of repentance, is those who ask themselves the question, Where am I? One who asks the question, where am I? Is able to, find, to read the story with a thought of repentance. Whereas if you don't, there is no. But you obviously do the tshuva process, it still is able to clean your nishama. But to be able to find God, you have to ask the question, where am I? What am I doing here? And when you do that, Rabbi Nachman says, anyone who hears this has a thought of repentance, who hears it really, because his heart is open to it. What's the first word in Yiddish? I forgot the word in Yiddish. I wanted to find it. I didn't end up searching it up. But the stories of the lost princess and all the 13 tales were written in Yiddish, in Rabbi Nachman's language. And the first word is, I forgot the word, but actually if you look at the word baderech on the journey, in Yiddish, Yiddish written inside the Hebrew letters, is actually gematria 148, gematria Nachman. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman's entire purpose that we talked about is the journey. It's not about the result. And what's the entire purpose of the story is that no matter how far you, uh, at the end of the story, they mention the concept that the viceroy, I'm not going to get into the entire story because it's a story that could take uh, hours to explain. But at the end, he finds the princess. He just didn't say how. He, 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 at the end, he didn't reveal the ending of the story. He just said he finds it. No ending. There's no, nothing spectacular about the ending. He just says he finds the story. That's, they find the princess. That's it. He just ruined the whole story. He told me the first sentence. I mean, whatever the end, he said it's not special. <laughs> but the point, the point is the not that. Yeah, exactly. The point is not that he finds the prince, but how he finds her. So why did he start with the the, the story baderech on the journey? Because the entire point of the story is the derech. When we go on the derech and on the path, we're gonna find her automatically. Whether we get the sin, whether we commit the sin, or whether we don't commit the sin, whether we refrain from doing this or that, whether we do the mitzvah or not, whether we end up keeping Shabbat at the end of our lives or not. If we go on the journey and on the path to want to get there, we committed it. That's it. We find the princess. We find our soul. The princess is an allusion to the soul, an allusion to the Shekhinah, an allusion to the divine presence, God. If we go on the journey, that's it. The rest of the work is done. So, inside the story, um, fast forwarding, the, vis the king basically loved, he has six sons, one daughter. He loves all the sons and all the daughter, but he loves the daughter more than anyone. And what happens? He gets in a fight with the daughter. He pushes the daughter away. The daughter ends up going and gets lost. And there's an entire secret with how the king says it. He said, may the, may the no good one take you. Not a deep secret there, but we're not going to get into the specifics. What happens? The princess gets lost and she ends up in a castle. And the viceroy tells the king, I'm going to go find her. So he sets out for years to go find her. And he goes to one place, he finds her and she tells him, I cannot escape from this castle. Now go to this place and stay there, wait for me for a year. And there, by the end of the year, you'll see me and you'll be able to take me back to the king. He waits for the year. What happened on the 365th day, the last day of the year, he sins. 
Because do not eat from the tree that is inside that forest, that is inside that orchard, because you're going to fall into a deep uh, slumber, right? Mm-hmm. He eats from the tree on the last day. And there's a lot of deep secrets with this with regard to we struggle all our lives. We wait 364 days and right at the end, when Avram is petach ha'ohel, right at the entrance of the gate, what happens? Kechom ayom. What does Rabbi Nathan say? Why kechom? Because the Yetzirah has heated up to get you right when you're at the entrance of the gate of finding God, the entrance of the tent of God. What happens? The Yetzirah piles up all the heat and all the, basically the fuming that it has when it sees you that you're close and pushes you away. When you're on the 365th day, the last day of the year, where you're right next to God, that's when the Yetzirah discourages a person the most. What happens? He falls into the deep slumber. She sees him. Ends up going to a thing. Uh, ends up going to a different. Uh, ends up going to a different place. And there's a lot of these secrets. He ends up finding the princess again. She tells him, "Wait for me seventy years." What is seventy years? And then what happens? She says, "On the seventieth year, do not, do not drink from the river of wine." Do not drink. She said, "Do not drink wine." My bad. Do not drink wine. What happens? On the literally the last day of those seventy years, he goes. He looks at a river. It's, it's uh, white, like clear water. But what? It smells like wine. And what is that? This is a deep secret about the philosophy of life. A person can fall into the trap of philosophy, whereas the person sees that it smells like wine. It is wine. It looks like water. What? He's too sophisticated. So what happens? He falls into the traps and drinks the wine and falls asleep. When the princess sees that he's asleep after the end of 70 years, she starts crying and crying. And on her, her bandana, basically, she writes in her tears the message to how to find her. He wakes up, sees the attendant next to him, and says, that's it. I'm going on the journey on my own. And what's the secret of this? The man did not go on the journey with anyone else. It's his own journey to find. That's why Rabbi Nachman was very big on never doing anything against it, taking against free will. He never did it and forced anyone to do anything. He always said something, but he always left option for both of them. Why? Because if the tzaddik tells you something, you lose your free will. Because there's so much fear involved in that. So what does Rami Nachman always do? He always wants it to come from you. And that's why everything we do when we come to the tzaddik and all these things, it's from our own volition. We come to the tzaddik, he doesn't tell us anything because he's not alive technically at this moment. But what? Through our own volition and our own will, we do the things that we want. We do chatzot, we do hidbot, do the lowest people are speaking to God for an hour a day. Why? Because they've taken upon themselves and upon their will to change their nature and to do things that they never thought they could. This is what the Viceroy is saying. He's saying, I cannot have you the attendant by my side because the journey is on my own. No one can sway me in this. I have to go on the journey on my own and find God on my own. He goes out and sets for years in the desert to find the castle where this princess said she was of a mountain of pearls and a, a castle of gold. And he goes and what happens? He encounters giants. And these giants tell him, what? That makes no sense. You're going to find a princess in a castle of gold and a mountain of pearls? What is that? <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing. But he's so stubborn. He's such an akshan, a st- stiff-necked person. He goes and tries, he tells the giant anyways, I don't care, I'm going to find her. Help me or not. So what the giant is forced to help him. Because the truth is, even the people who are against us and push us away, if we're so stubborn in our, our Abu Hashem or serving God, they are the, going to be the ones to help us. Why did it say? The one pushing us away, the one who... Paro, the one who pushes us away from God, is in fact the only one to bring us close. What did Rabbi Nathan say? He brings a Midrash. Paro is the one that brought them close to their father in heaven. Why? The one that pushes you away is in fact going to be the only one who brings you close. It's a paradox. But the truth is, all those deep things in life, when it comes to the tzaddik and people say, why are you following this tzaddik? Or for example, with Rabbi Nachman all the time. Or people say about Saba, why do you believe in the petek, this, that? It's a simple amuna. And when we're so stubborn in our simple emuna, everything crumbles around us and literally everyone's going to be forced to help us. So the giant says, I have another giant, I have a brother that's a giant across the other side of the desert. Go to him. He searches out for years and finds the other giant. The brother, the brother of the giant who was in charge of all the animals says, I'll summon all the animals to help you out. He summons all the animals and says, there's nothing there. I don't know what you're searching out for. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Because logically, a castle, of pearl, a castle of gold does not make any sense. Especially in a desert where there's no light. The giant says, I don't know what you're doing. The man says, help me out because I don't care. I know I'm going to find this person. He says, okay, I have another giant. And he's in charge of all the winds. 
And by the end of the story, he comes to the third giant, the third brother. And the third, and why all giants, by the way? Because the biggest people that are going to, the people that are going to be pushing us down are the biggest people. People with beards. The people with Labanim and Peot are going to be the ones pushing us away from our Abad Hashem. Because the truth is, there's a lot of Shekech. And Saba was big on this. There's a lot of what we call falsehood in this world. And the giants are the people that everyone considers them giants. But what? They're going to be the ones pushing all of us down. Why? Because that's the way of the world. And all that's there to do is the giants there to build up your strength to, that make you become even bigger than the giant himself. Just by being stubborn and serving God. By being stubborn and coming close to the tzaddik. When we basically nullify ourselves and we just say we're going for it no matter what. Even though the entire world says against it. Echadaya Avram. Avram was one. Why? Because the entire world was serving, was serving idols and he said, no, that's it. There's one God. And that's the, way the, that's the way of the world. So what happens? The third giant summons all the winds. They find nothing. But what happens? One wind delays. There's one wind that's left back and comes back an hour later. After all the other winds come back. The giant gets upset at the wind. He says, I told you, to bring, I, to, I brought all the winds. Why weren't you here? He says, I was carrying the princess to her castle of gold and her mountain of pearls. And when the person heard that, he realized that was the, that was the thing. That was the, the final solution. But what's the wind? The deep secret with regard to the fourth wind, it's the fourth wind that comes back. Why the fourth wind? Well, we talked about the fourth level of holiness. The Ksipab Noga, the place where it's very confusing. Because the only way to find the princess and the redemption comes through the place where it's mixed up. The Hechalat Mogot, where we talked about. The chamber of exchanges. Good, bad, evil, this, that. That's where you find God. That's where you find the princess. That's where you find your soul. Your Nishama. The place where it's difficult. The place where it's confusing. You don't know whether it's the tree of life, the tree of death, where the Yitzhak is pushing you in this direction, that direction. No, in that place specifically, you're going to find God. And that's why it's the fourth wind alluding to the fourth kippah, the fourth level, which has to do with this place of exchanges and all these things. You want to share something about Saba and stuff like that uh, along these lines? Yeah, start with Saba if you want to, then I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll chime in with a story. So, a little bit about Saba, because Saba was, you wanted to talk about how he plays a part in the redemption, no? Yeah, his, his role in the whole Rabbi Nachman movement push. I can, if you want to start with that. Go. So, the very beginning, we, we learned about um, the Anavut and the, and the nothingness that the Tzadikim have. If you look at the Tzadikim throughout history, you'll see that they all have one very strong theme in common. And if you look at the story of Moshe Rabbeinu also, when Hashem created the world, He waited for one person to give the Torah to Him. So originally, it's written, I believe, in the Midrash that Hashem wanted to give the Torah to Adam. He wanted to have Shabbat and then immediately hand Him the Torah. But then He couldn't because He didn't see the Midah yet formed in Him. So what was this Midah? It was the perfection of, Ana, of being Anav. It was the perfection of being absolutely nothing and being humble in front of Hashem. So every big tzaddik has it, but nobody had perfected it to the highest level. And so... Hashem waited and Hashem waited and Hashem waited and he saw amazing levels of perfection in, in worshipping of Hashem through Avraham's chesed and through Adam and through the different ways that he had manifest different forms of creation and stuff like that. But and you have obviously the Tiferet and, and the Tushah of the Torah of Yaakov and you have the Gvura that comes from Yitzchak and, and the absolute Yirat Hashem that Yitzchak had. But up until Moshe, no one saw what real Anava was. Real, real, the core of being absolutely nothing. And from there, we learn, obviously, David Amelach took a lot from that. A lot of very big tzaddikim took from that. Yosef took from that. A lot of very big people took from that. And Nachman talks a lot about Anava. Like we said in Lesson 6, it starts off the lesson by talking about the person that wants to get close to Hashem. He needs to make himself in, like nothing in front of Hashem. So, Hashem waited until being able to give the Torah to the person that's the most Anav. Something that's very special is Rabbi Nachman said that my fire will burn until the time of Mashiach. But he never revealed... He never revealed a song that he says was going to be sung in the time of the Mashiach. And the Zohar says that there's also going to be, and there's different references of this stuff. And the Zohar talks about, like Moshe said earlier, there's a song that's going to be sung once. It's going to be doubled, tripled, and quadrupled. And there's no reference to it anywhere. And Rabbi Nachman brings it down, but Rabbi Nachman doesn't reveal it. Now, up until the time of Saba Israel, to be able to explain Saba Israel, I'm going to give a parable that's brought down in the lesson of Likutei Alachot from something that Rabbi Natan teaches. And it's in, the, it's in the halachot that talk about whenever a person gives away money and the laws in, in regards to being able to pay back debt and how it works and how you're able to receive the debt. And if you're not there, then how do you receive the debt from someone? Is there a messenger? 
And what happened was, is that he gave a parable of a person that wins the lottery in that, in that section of Oachayim. And he says that when a person um, won the lottery, he put out an ad in the newspaper the next day. Imagine a person just winning millions and millions of dollars, not billions of dollars, and just putting out an ad and just saying, um, whoever needs money, whoever needs help, come and see me and I will lend you whatever money you want. No problem. No questions asked. Next day, he wakes up, he has a huge line outside the door. And so people come and they start asking for all the money, no questions asked, very easily just hands out the money. And then um, he says, in a year from now, come back and pay back the money. Waits a year, comes outside, sees no one shows up. Right? It's pretty obvious if you could imagine today that very likely idea, very likely story. And then eventually goes back inside the house and realizes that no one showed up. It's okay, no big deal. Um, he didn't even really consider it his, essentially. Um, and then he, as he's inside and he's talking to his wife, he hears a knock at the door. And he goes and answers the door and he sees a man that's like a homeless man. A man that looks like he's from the absolute depths of the world. And the man says to him, I'm here to return. You know, I came here. I'm supposed to show up a, a year later. He said, okay, great. How much money do you have to give me back? He said, I have nothing. He said, but he saw that with the guy's sincerity and the guy literally looks like a homeless man. He said the guy must have literally gone through the most devastating year and he actually has nothing. So he said, okay, so then why do you even show up? He said, because you told me to show up after a year and I had to, but I don't have anything. So can I do something to, to repay you? Can I do something to work for you? So stop there for a second. All right, that's the parable. When Hashem, before Hashem created the world, the angels, it's brought down in the Midrash that... The angels came to Hashem and said that Bnei Yisrael is going to sin. So don't create the world for them. So Hashem, it says in the Midrash that he threw his emet to the earth because they asked him a question that was so strong that his emet, his truth, had, broke, had been broken down. And he didn't have an answer for the angels. And then in that moment, it says that there was a new emet that was born from the earth. And in that emet was the concept of tzaddikim. And in that moment, Hashem created the concept of tzaddik before the world was created. And then from there, a tzaddik appeared. And it says in the Midrash, Zit Tzadik Yisod Olam. This is the Tzadik, the foundation of the world. And then the Tzadik Yisod Olam responded to Hashem. He said, I say that you should create the world. He said, why? But the angels are saying that they're going to sin. He said, you created Shuvah. You created the concept of Shuvah. So you can create the world. But then the angels answered when Hashem said, oh, he said, you could do Shuvah. The angel said, no. Because what if they don't do Shuvah? And then Hashem said, they make a good point. And then the tzaddik said, I'm guarantor of everyone. Even if they don't do tshuva, I'm the guarantee that you create the world. I will make sure they do tshuva. Yeah. And so there's, there's a very famous story that's brought down essentially that Rabbi Nachman brings down when he says that I'm the guarantor. Because when Hashem first created the world, he showed all the final generations of all the tzaddikim. We talked about the five levels of Moshe in a different class. The final one is the Mashiach. The Mashiach, when Hashem brought it, he said, look at the final generations because they saw the beginning of time to the end of time. And the Mashiach came and he said, I cannot guarantee that. So I need a guarantor because we need two edim. And, and then Rabbi Nachman said, I will come and I will be the ed. And that's why the Mashiach needs Rabbi Nachman. That's why he said that he will come to him and that's why he will be one of my students because he needs my Torah. Because through the teaching, that's why Rabbi Nachman says in Chaim Moran and in his teachings, he says, I've prepared everything for the Mashiach because even the Mashiach will need this preparation to allow for the tshuva. The Mashiach's soul will also be very, very special, like the soul of Moshe, like the soul of Rabbi, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. All of it comes from the same teachings. Even Rabbi Shimon Mayochai's teachings, Rabbi Nachman's teachings, they all come from the same, the same ideas, the same roots, the same concepts. They all delve, delve, delve into the final places, until the final revelation that people can understand on the lowest level, like Moshe was explaining. So now we can understand the halacha, according to the Kabbalah. The halacha says that if you borrow money and you give money to someone, it says that if you borrow money and you give money to someone, then the person, if you want to receive the money back, there needs to be an aid over there and there needs to be people that say that if the person sees, he says, if I'm not here at the time that you need to return the money to me, then you can give it to this person. But if the person there did not agree to that and they did not say that, then a person needs to write a letter with a signature saying that this person is the shaliach that he can receive the money for me. So what does Rabbi Natan say? He says now after this story. He says, okay, we learned this story over here in the parable of a man that has the lottery and he wins and then stuff like that. The rich man was so happy when the man came knocking at the door and was so in love with the man's avodah that he came to him, even though no one else showed up, even though he had nothing in his hand. He said, okay, you're going to work for me. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to knock at all the doors and you're going to tell them to come bring back the money. 
Now there's something that happens in the guarantee with Hashem up there when Rabbi Nachman signed. Hashem said, okay, you want to be the guarantor in front of the angels? Here's what we're going to do. So they made a Midat din on the spot and they wrote down the din in fire. And he said, I'm letting you know right now about the concept of the tshuva and do you sign? And he said, I sign. And he said, Sadiq Yisodolam on the spot. And he said, he's going to guarantee it. He said, but when Hashem creates the world and he gives you an opportunity to live and he gives you your neshama and he gives you the mitzvot, he does what? He gives you everything. He gives you the money. He gives you the loan. You come in on day one and you take it. And you owe it back. You owe the guf, you owe the neshama, you owe the refua, you owe everything. You owe everything that is given to you by Hashem. Hashem does everything. But if you do not respect it and you do not come back to return it properly, then you're in debt. So what does the tzaddik do? When we don't do anything properly, the tzaddik pays down the debt all the time. That's why there's the lesson in the Kutimahan that you have to come back to the tzaddik and you have to come back and say, I need help for all the things that I lost. Because we lose things throughout the year all the time in bad thoughts, in bad machshavot, in bad actions. So that's why there's the whole concept of the sod of the Kabbalah of why you need to go to the tzaddik. That's why Yehoshua, when he first, Yehoshua was attached to Moshe and we see Kalev goes into Eretz Yisrael with the Meraglim that sinned. What does he do first? He goes to Marat HaMechpala. He goes and prays at the Kever of the tzaddikim because they need the concept of the tzaddikim. Moshe, when he left Egypt, he took what? He took the bones of Yosef, Yosef at Tzadik. It's the same concept that repeats. Yosef, when he was about to sin, he saw the face of what? Yaakov. Because every time you're about to fall, you need to connect back to the Tzadik. It's a concept that existed throughout the beginning of time. So all of this continues to repeat itself. So when Rabbi Nachman signs this, and he signs this document, and he does this whole process, the same thing then comes back down at this point. So he says, you want to know what happens then? After whenever you come down to the story and the parable of the money, he says... When Rabbi Nachman came into the world, he was waiting. And when he saw someone like Saba that made himself like nothing, he said, Hashem looked for Moshe that was so anav that he could give the Torah. He said, I was waiting for one of my followers to come that would be so anav that I could send down my letter. Now the Anshei Knesset Agdola, when they prepared the tefillah, the whole tefillah was organized. It's written down. You can literally look it up in the Gemara. That Hashem sent down a letter of one tefillah. It's the Baruch Shamar. The Baruch Shamar is a petek. We read it every single day. It's a petak min It said, add this to the tefillah. Add this to the sadah, the tefillah. We add it. There are many tzaddikim that have received petak. There are many tzaddikim and stories that have happened. But this one's specifically hidden. This one's hidden because it's also the last one. So, to give a little bit of a hint and into a secret of, of Saba Yisrael and the specialness of it is, Saba Yisrael, he never ever said and he never ever spoke about any of his greatness. He never said anything like Moshe said. Everything he did was to bring another Jew back to Hashem. Everything he did was that, it's not me. Hashem, Rabbi Nachman, gave me the petek, signed the petek. There's incredible stories. I mean, I'm not going to share all of them. Maybe we'll share some tomorrow. But everything he did was to be able to help other people come back to Hashem. He just said, pick up a book of Rabbi Nachman. When you read up Saba's story about how he even got close to Rabbi Nachman, how he found a book next to a trash can sure. that's called Hishtaput Nefesh. It's the book of the outpourings of the soul. It was the first book he found. And even ha it's a book on Hidbodidut. It's not even... It didn't even have Rabbi Nachman's name and he didn't even know who it was. He just found it and it just was all his salvation that he was looking for. It shows you that from the depths of despair, you can find Hashem. Now, to show you how special Saba was, Saba was born in the absolute depths and the pits of absolute Tum'ah. It's written down in the Midrashim and the Kabbalah that whenever people are born, this is how Mazalot work and the Kabbalah works and the mysticism around the astrology works. Um, for those that believe and those that don't believe, is that there's planets that align and stars that align when a person is born. And it affects the way the person's character is in their tikkun and their test. Okay? Now, when Moshe was born, there was a very bizarre alignment that came up. It was, in fact, so bizarre that technically it aligned for every single potential bad thing to ever enter into his body. Murder, rape, um, every single bad test that could ever exist came into the nisham of Moshe. But Moshe overcame every single one of them. Moshe was born into the absolute depths of Egypt, in the depth of the Tuma and arose from all of that. And there is also a story and about Moshe Rabbeinu that when a king wanted to see the, the face of Moshe Rabbeinu and he saw the face, he said, that's the face of a murderer, mm. of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, and it's, and it's because that Moshe, all of the concept of Moshe was overcoming this. David HaMelech, same thing. David HaMelech also was supposed to die on the day that he was born. All the, there's massive hidden secrets within all of the opposition of the Yitzhara forcing and trying to kill the Kedusha before it enters and block it. So before Rabbi Nachman came into the world, um, the Yetzah had an argument, um, the Satan had an argument with Hashem and said, Hashem said we're going to bring this Neshama now into the world. It was right after the time of the Baal Shem Tov, Baal Shem Tov was still alive, and um, he said we're going to send it down. And the, the Sitrachah said no, 
you can't because then I have no more work left to do. He says, then I have no argument left. So he said, I don't care. You have time. I'm sending it down. Figure it out. The Yitzel eventually came back with an argument. And he said, okay, I'm ready to go. You can send the soul down now. It came back with the concept of machloket, the bilbul, the confusion. Because sometimes when you're going to win or you're going to lose, there's a winner, there's a loser. But sometimes there's confusion. We see it happen every single day of our lives. We're seeing it with an election right now. There's confusion. We're seeing it with the way we feel. Like we said earlier, sometimes you do a mitzvah, sometimes you do it. There's confusion. We're living in a world of confusion. It's bilbul. The whole thing that we're going to talk about maybe tomorrow night on the parasha is entering into the bilbul. How Hashem made Avram realize he entered him into the darkest place in the heat of the sun on the worst day to say, I want you to serve me even there. Even in that darkness. The orla, the brit milah. Why do we, when we do a brit milah, this we'll also talk about tomorrow. There's a whole Kabbalah, the Zohar talks about why do you not completely destroy the orla, the foreskin, whenever you do a brit milah. We have to break three quarters of it but then flip it inside out and then keep some of the bad. It's because you work through the bad. We'll go through more of that tomorrow. So Rabbi Nachman came in and he said, essentially, when the Yetzirah said the Machloket, he said, okay, you could, send them out. you could send them down. Because he knew that he can do something through the Bilbul, through there's confusion. And if you see, there's always confusion against Tadikim. David Amelach, there was confusion. He was the last of the seven sons of Yishai and stuff like that. There was a big problem. It's like, oh, why him? Why him? Moshe, same thing. Why me? Pick Aaron. Thing. They, when they went into Egypt, they didn't want to accept him. And then there was Korach, there was the Meraglim, there was the Cheta Egel. They didn't believe in Moshe many times. There's always confusion. Avram Avinu was Echad Avram. No one believed in Avram. Eventually then had converts. It's confusion all the time, non-stop. Every single moment is like that. You know, there is also a good example, like the book of Tehillim. I don't know, for many years, I think seven or 70 mm -hmm. years, was not allowed to yeah. be read. Yeah. You imagine the yeah. book of Tehillim that we read every day now mm -hmm. was not allowed to be read for many years. And, and so, when Rabbi Nachman... Um, the reason why I was sharing this is because the point is that a lot of what Saba did in, in order to be able to achieve the level that he did was only through nullifying himself and making himself as absolutely nothing. To, so to show this, just like Moshe Rabin was born and almost died in Egypt, they almost killed him because he was born prematurely and then he eventually had to go through the Nile River where he almost died and then eventually ended up in the house of Paro which he should have technically died and, and not even existed in Tektusha. But... It was just salvation after salvation. David Amelach was supposed to die when he was born and, and overcame that as well because of Adam and because of a lot of foresight of Tzadikim. But Saba Israel, a lot of people don't know this story, but before he was born, his mother was pregnant with him and he was in Teveria in Israel. And in Teveria, there was the outside um, toilets that were essentially because they didn't have plumbing systems probably about 100 years ago. More, actually more like 120 something years ago. Um, she had gone outside in the middle of the night and there was separation between the men and the woman. And she had gone outside, but she was actually fully about to go into labor and her water broke and no one was there in the middle of the night. So she started to scream and she was about to obviously have her child be born. And through the circumstances that had happened through the bilbul and through all the bunch of chaos that had happened in that night, Saba was actually born and fell into the excrement that existed in the toilets that were outside there. And a man came running that no one saw, no one knew because no one was around and helped her out because she was devastated and she didn't understand what was happening and helped pull him out from the lowest place on earth in the absolute trash and the absolute filth of the excrement of the earth and cleaned him up and from there, Saba was born. This is like, it's one of the most insane things of all time. Saba, when he grew up, when he grew up, he didn't understand and he couldn't learn Torah. He didn't have enough food to eat. He lost his son because his son died of starvation. The people mocked him because he was Braslev. They didn't let him study in yeshiva. They told him in yeshiva, if you are going to study Braslev books, we're going to not only give you absolutely nothing, they threw him out onto the street. They used to mock him. He was literally one. He was absolutely nothing. From day one, Hashem conditioned him to be like the earth. And he worked on it and he dug and he dug and he dug. This is what we learned from Avram and his parashat. This is what we should learn for ourselves is that we have to make ourselves to find Hashem. You have to find yourself and you have to dig deep. So I'm going to finish off with this and I'll let Moshe also share a story to complete the story of, of Saba. Enter a little bit into the petek, which is really the essence of this. And we're going to go into why it done and ask the question about that. When Saba was 25 years old, he already had the custom because he had already lived 
with his teacher, Rabbi Yisrael Karduner, who I shared some stories with, and Avraham Uyal and stuff like that. He was a massive tzaddik that was Breslev. Saba already at this point was eating very little every single day, multiple fasts, multiple time, hours and hours of eating do it. He was waking up every single day at Chatzot, and he woke up in the middle of the night to be able to pray and lament. And there's a Breslev Minhag, which is that you don't eat between Chatzot till after Shacharit. This could be like six, seven, eight hours. So you wake up at like 1, 2 a.m., you pray, you meditate, you do Tikkun Chatzot, you learn the Zohar, you then prepare for your Tefillah, then you eventually get the Shacharit, and then you do Shacharit, which can be lots of time depending on your meditations, and then after that you can have breakfast. It's like already they slept one hour maybe, and, and dedication, running to the middle of the forest in the middle of the night and just screaming to Hashem. Like, these are the levels of dedication that people don't speak about, but it was mamash nothingness. That's the level of some of these breasts of our Hasidim. So he woke up, he did chetzot, and he started feeling very sick on the, tenth, on the 17th of Tammuz. By the way, what happened on the 17th of Tammuz? Shiva Shabbat Tammuz is what? Is the day that Moshe came down from the mountain and saw the Egel Azav and broke the Luchot. On this day, Saba eats bread, does netilat and eats bread without knowing that it's a fast, and falls into a massive depression in Shacharit. To the point that he shares the story with his students many years later. He says, if you can imagine, if you can imagine, already this is a guy that fasts multiple days a week. He only eats bread and tea. Since the age of six, he was fasting Monday, Thursday. He w- this is a person that, I mean, he had a I mean, we, we, don't, we could share stories of miracles, but the stories of miracles don't really impress in, in, in Breslev Hasidut because we care more about the, how the stories of how he devoted himself to Hashem. Because the miracles, lots of people can have devotion to miracles. The question is, how much did you dedicate? How much were you all in? How much was the path, not the result? So, Saba, 25 years old, experiences this. Shacharit comes to the time and then they realize it's Ta'anit and he realized what he did. He wants, now at this point, to commit suicide. That's how, that's how much he thinks to himself, I fell in front of Hashem. Now, a normal person, Bishogeg, first of all, it's not one of the most important fasts. It's by accident. al Alpialacha, you're fine. Like, it's not a big deal. Already he doesn't eat anything. But for him, he committed murder. And he, Mama, she says, I wanted to take a shovel and dig my own grave. He was depressed. He fell on the floor and everyone in the yeshiva already thought he was nuts because he was singing and dancing all day long and just clapping his hands and just telling everyone, come close to Hashem, come close to Hashem. 25 years old. And right now he wants to commit suicide. So he goes to the forest for six days without food, without water, disappears. And he just starts rolling in the mud and crying out to Hashem, why me, why me, why me? I don't, I don't know why I was, I was put on this earth anymore. He puts himself at the lowest point possible. At that point, he gets an idea in his head. And the idea starts to manifest. It says, go to your room, go to a bookshelf, and go pick up a book and you're going to find your salvation there. So it starts hitting him more and hitting him more and hitting more. Eventually, he says, you know what, fine, I'm going to follow this thought. And he goes to the room, he picks up a book. And in the book, he starts picking up and he starts learning on page 25, around the same age that he was, on, I think, the Likut al in, in, in section of Or Chaim, where he starts learning about Tefillin, I believe. And then in there, he starts reinforcing himself. He starts to feel a little bit better. And... But he realizes that as he starts to get a little distance, he starts to fall into depression again. He puts the book back. And as he's putting the book back, he sees a little leaf, leaflet falling out, a little pamphlet falling out. And then he goes and he grabs it. And then he starts seeing it. And one of the first words, Me'od haya kasheli laredet elecha It's the beginning of the petek. It was very hard for me to come down to you, my precious student. Kine neti me'od me'avodatecha. Because your avoda, avodatecha is your avoda, the way that you worship Hashem, Brought me a lot of pleasure. When he saw this and he read the Petek, he had, he went from the lowest pit of depression to the highest point of Simcha. Because he saw the Petek and he saw what the revelation was and he knew because already on his level and already what he had understood was already incredible. Keep in mind, he learned for five years with Rabbi Yisrael Karduner who was already a person that when people saw him, they said they saw an angel in front of their own eyes. And he was with him um, at that point, already for five years. So, understand that the revelation, Saba didn't even reveal the Petek till 60 years later. That's how Anav he was. He received it at 25, he, re- he revealed it at 85. Mm. He said for 60 years, he was saying, why me? It's not, I don't even deserve it. He knew the secrets of it. He knew the song. He was waiting for the time to reveal it. He said, I don't know what I need to do with it. It's, it's not even me. When he revealed it, he said, it's not even me. It's not even he gave it to me. It's not, there's no point. There's not my name in it. It doesn't mean anything. He just get people close to Amin Nachman. Get people close to Tzadikim. Get people close to Tefillah. Get people close to the Shuba. Because through the words, and then when he says over here, there's so many secrets of the Kabbalah. 
the name of the yud ke vav ke is also a four letter name you do yud yud he yud he vav yud he vav he it's a combination that forms 10 and that's why there's 10 and that's why there's the tikkun aklali that's why it's the brit that's why it's connected to avram avinu that's why you have to wait to go to the brit and wait for the right time there's all the secrets that are connected within the 10 that are within this miforash within a song that's four that can multiply that can do 1 plus 1 4 factorial creates 10 and so it corresponds to the four worlds, it corresponds to the creation of the world, it corresponds to so many different forms of creation. I listened to a class of two hours on the petek of a person that studied for probably, I don't know how many dozens of years, just studying the petek, a Breslev Chassid, and he found secrets within the petek. He says that, he explained that I listened to the class, I didn't finish it, but he shows you how every single letter corresponds to different generations that existed within the world in a perfect time sequence from the beginning of the world until the time of the Mashiach. And he showed it to Saba, and Saba said after he saw it, he said, yeah, that's one way to look at it also. He knew all the secrets that within it, and even Saba said in his life, he said, even this, he says, even I don't understand what this is. This is above what I understand, this petek. Rabbi Nachman brought down, going back to the halacha, to the back to the simple idea. He said, in Likut Arachot, this was at the time of Rabbi Natan, this is 200 years before. This is 150 years before Saba came into the world. He said, there's a person that comes, knocks at the door, and he doesn't have a dollar to give back after all the money he's borrowed. And he says, he has so much love from this person that comes and knocks at the door that even though he has nothing to give back, he says, don't worry, you're gonna come, you're gonna live with me, and I'm gonna take care of you, and you're gonna work for me, and you're gonna help bring everyone back. And what's the halakha? That if a person is not with you to witness, if I'm not here after a certain amount of time that you have to give me money, then you have to give it to them. Then you have to send a signed letter. And this is the signing of Rabbi Nachman in the letter. This is Rabbi Nachman's name. This is his handwritten signature. There's stories of how Saba Yishal brought Rabbanim in Beit Din Shilmala and Rabbi Nachman came down and said, this is my signature on this petek. I gave it to him. You have to believe in what he said. I could share some of those stories. I'll probably share some of them for tomorrow night. But in this case, People have to understand that this is a very special thing and it's nothing of their own kavod. There's no kavod over here that would ever be given to Saba. There's no kavod that would ever be given to Rabbi Nachman. All the kavod that we give, they purely reflect and they give it back to Hashem. That's the sign of true tzaddikim, is that whenever you go to any of these people, that's why they didn't want any kavod. There was no rabbanim that were like, oh, please stand up when I walk in. In Breslav, there is none of that. There is none of that at all. Because for them, if they even accepted even an ounce of kavod, even a second of kavod, even a, a micro belief in the mind of kavod, it was, a, it was pure heresy. It was as if they didn't believe in God. Because everything they needed was purely for Hashem. That's why for him, it wasn't even, it's for me, it's, so it's talmidi, talmidi hayakarat for every single student of Rabbi Nachman, mm -hmm. every single student of every single person. It's not for me, it's every single person needs to hear it. And a person can get refua. Saba used to go, he used to give the little petak and give necklaces to people that were sick in hospitals. He said, just having this will give refua. He used to heal people by just taking the petak and putting them by his bed. That's it. Just take it and put it in someone's house. A person is going through a divorce. A person is going through a, a, a difficult financial issue. A person, just take it and put it in the house. You're going through a difficult thing, just say the words. That's it. Just say the word once and, and it brings insane salvation. And it's only because what? We had this concept of a guarantor. And if you can go to the guarantor and you can say, I'm attaching myself to you, you don't have to do, it's not that you don't have to do anything else. He will bring you through the path. It's not going to be easy, but he teaches you and he teaches you through Avram and through the biggest Sadiqim that you will go through difficult things. Habib Nachman taught us one thing, is that we can look through the Hasidut and the Baal Shem Tov before at looking at life being so beautiful and all the Torah being so beautiful and wondrous. That's amazing. We do that. He said, but I want to show you something else that no one else showed before me. He says, I want to show you that you can serve Hashem in the depths of the darkest sins that you can imagine, that you will bring Hashem there too. That's one of the things that I, I'm, I'm going to talk about That's tomorrow night as well. But that is the Geula. It's Rabbi Nachman said, do not despair because no matter how far down you go, no matter how bad your sins are, no matter how bad you think you can go, how far away you can be from me, he says, have no despair. Hashem will be there with you. Hashem will be there with you. And Moshe couldn't reveal this. Moshe knew this, he couldn't reveal it. David knew it, he couldn't reveal it. Rabbi Shubham Rechai knew it, he couldn't reveal it either. None of them can reveal it. Moshe knew it because it's hidden in the secrets of the, of the 13 Midot HaChamim of Hashem. That's why Rashi says, on the simplest level, in there is hidden a secret. It says, Hashem, Hashem. Hashem, why? Because the first Hashem is to show you that from the, from the upper levels of worshiping Hashem. And the second Hashem, why is Hashem's name written twice? Because you can worship Hashem even in the depths of your sins. That's that Hashem is found there. That's why there's 13 tales also. Yeah. For the 13 Midot HaChamim. That's why there's lots of concepts that correlate. There's 13 Midot HaChamim in the beard tales, if you study in... 13. 
in the secrets of the beard in the Zohar, it talks about the 13 spots on the beard where that bring Rachamim down into Hashem. That's why Kabbalists grow out their beards and stuff like that. I mean, the stories are endless, but all of it is to say why him, why special people, why special tzaddikim. This, this is just, this is obviously something wondrous, but the truth is that it's very simple. It's very simple no matter what. It comes down to learning, to making yourself anav in front of Hashem, to make yourself nothing, and just to have a will to want to get close to Hashem. That's it. I want to get close to Hashem, and I understand that tzaddikim have the capacity to be able to help me. They care about me. Hashem brought tzaddikim only in this the world, only for the concept of bringing people back to Hashem. That's only why they exist. And the tzaddikim know that. And if a tzaddik takes any kavod for himself, and he has any honor in the fact that, oh, he has Torah, he feels special, he feels great, it's not a tzaddik at all. In fact, it's opposite. It's a very, very big sin. That's why, it's, that's why the level of the Yitzhah of some tzaddikim is so high because Rabbanim, they think that they can sit down all day in yeshiva, but they take the kavod. They sit down and they take kavod. That's their Yitzhah. You think that they're going to be sitting down all day long and studying Torah, they don't have a Yitzhah. Your Yitzhah grows with you as you get bigger. And when you go to the highest levels, your Yitzhah is even bigger up there. And for them, they have to be very careful that they don't accept one ounce, one grain, one drop of Yetzirah, of one piece of Kavod. And unfortunately, today, very few people understand this Kabbalah. Very few people understand it. We learn on a very simple level. But it can be learned also in the depths of the Zohar and the Arizal. We can study it there too. And people don't realize that. So everything that he taught is to completely reverse all the knowledge that we have and to completely infuse ourselves and bring us down to the lowest level. You want to share one last story of Saba or? I'll do a quick one minute one because it talks about Kavod. You know Saba when he was invited to a wedding, it's a very funny story, I find it very funny because this was Saba's way. When he was invited to a wedding, the big rabbi there asked him to do the Kiddush. So Saba's way, when he'd go into public places, he'd make sure that he was hidden. He'd do things that would push people against him to the point where they'd question why he was even there or who this person was. Saba gets invited for the Kiddush and the, he says, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Rabbi puts him into doing it. He says, okay. He starts the Kiddush and what happens? We all know the Kiddush of Shabbat. Yom Hashishi, he pauses. He's like, he starts looking with a face that he didn't know the rest of the words. He goes to the Rabbi Looking at him for a minute, the rabbi at one point gets it that he wants him to mumble in the words. So what's he doing? He says, Yom Shishi, so the rabbi is going, Bayahulu. He's going, Bayahulu. <laughs> and he goes like this for a minute and a half to the end of it. He finishes the kiddush with the other rabbi mumbling him the entire word. <laughs> and Saba, at the end of it, and all the students of Saba knew this, so they didn't have a problem. They were dying of laughter. Everyone else comes to Saba, goes to the student and says, Who's this rabbi you have? <laughs> Who's this rabbi? <laughs> but everyone knew it. That's Saba's way. Saba was never... You see, he was joking around one time. He had a big hat and stuff. He took off the hat. He started playing with it, touching his beard, moving his hands, closing his eyes. So one of the guys asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm imitating the big people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imitating the big Havanin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.